I love it when worship leaders come in and decide what they're going to do is they're going to shake it up and make it all open and free. They, they give no thought at all to the speaker. But they now got to spend their time doing this and pirouetting and... Anyway. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> no, no, no violins. Yeah, thanks. Let's pray, shall we? Oh, Lord, yeah. Shaking it up. Doing it different. Being different. Being in you. Lord, I pray that uh, as the words come out of my mouth, Lord, they are your words. Speaking into us. Shaking it up. Making it different. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Shaking it up, making it different, by the way, is not the title of the sermon. Um, please bear with us on the uh, sound. Uh, if I'm honest, where I'm positioned and where we are going to be for this time, Mike, is a nightmare for the PA uh, person. So bear with Subana as I don't echo too much. Anyway, right, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. If you'd like to dive in. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30. Or don't dive in. So excuse me, if I'm talking to you, my back is to you. I'm deliberately not being rude. Bless you. Um, but um, obviously in the way that this is this morning, I need to do a lot of this. We're going to look at the, what is commonly known in the NIV and other uh, books, subtitled The Parable of the Talents. And before you all sit there and think, yep, know this one. Gosh, here comes a condemnation sermon. Shaking it up, making it different. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one. Two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who'd received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant uh, with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know you are a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Feeling cheerful right now? Mm. 
Notice in the NIV, or most of the slightly older translations, it is known as the parable of the talents, and it is in most uh, commentaries. But actually, if you note in the NLT, they don't use the word talent, but bags of silver. The problem is we hear the word talent, and things like Britain has got talent springs to mind, doesn't it? Okay, let's all start singing, or doing something with a dog, <laughs> or pulling funny dance movements. And so the problem is we look at the word talent in our modern thinking, and we think gift, something within me that I'm able to do. And that's not quite here, hence the NLT's got it right with bags of silver, because actually a talent was a weight, and later it come to mean large amounts of money. And here, by the way, the one that got five, the bags of silver would have been equal to something like 20 years worth of wages. That's a lot of money. Looking at the passage just a tad more closely, because you always have to take everything in the Bible in context of where it's written. You can't just take those few verses and then go, oh, ta-da! You've got to look about what is Jesus saying? Why has Matthew put this together in the gospel and the way he's done? Well, firstly, Jesus has actually given three parables back to back here about what the kingdom of God is like. And the talents parable, this bags of silver parable, is right in the middle of them. Well, it's about, well, the first one is we have the ten bridesmaids, which really, in a quick, short, piffy, is about being prepared for the coming reign of God, being ready, being prepared. And after our talent parable, there is the sheep and goats image, which is about, not about faith by works, by the way, giving to the poor and the needy, but it's about relationship with Jesus, which then results in the works of giving to those in need. You don't earn credit with God. You already have that through Jesus Christ and through your appreciation of the credit you have with God, you do the stuff that he wants you to do. But all three parables are about, really, within a limitation, we can look back through Jesus, of end times. Jesus' return, all of humanity will have to give an account for what they have done or not done. That's here. And these days, we seem to forget to talk about the end times. We like to talk about it in Jesus' return, everything's going to be hallelujah for us Christians. But actually, each of us have to give account. Every human being that's ever lived or is alive now has to give account. So in this particular parable, the key word is faithful. Brilliant. I'll have somebody else preach it for me. It's great. Hey, listen, out of the mouths of babes comes the truth of God. And some of us feel like that right now. The master has gone away, given responsibilities to his servants to trade for him whilst he is away. These bags of silver are not the gifts imparted through the spirit or, or some people read it as, oh yes, it's about my spiritual gift and I'm not using it. it it's not that. That's not quite right. It's, you've already got abilities and gifts already. The bags of silver represent the master giving you responsibility. Do you understand? Giving you responsibility. The bags represent responsibility given in light of your abilities and opportunities that come your way. There is a distinct difference. We sometimes read this and think, oh, Jesus has given me, I don't know, a, a talent, I don't know, the gift of prophecy or something, just, just for the sake of That's not what it's about. This is not about that. You already sort of, if you have that, you already have that. It's actually a representation of actually what is your, the responsibility that is laid upon you. These bags are about the amount of responsibility that God has given you in using your gifts and abilities and the opportunities. As one commentator put it, Green puts it, it's actually an investment the master makes in his servants. He wants to be able to rely on us in its use.
This particular parable, along with the other two, are dealing with the issue of Judgment Day. Proceeding in chapter 24, is Jesus talking about, and not only about, by the way, I just... Sometimes people get really caught up in that. I'm not going to get into a day, but sort of end of days, you can see there's a sort of a prophetic word in there. Matthew's put these three parables at the end of that whole talk because the early Christians were thinking that Jesus should have come back by now. And he wasn't. And it's like, well, what do we do? He hasn't got what we're meant to be doing. And what you see here is actually Matthew's trying to prepare, well, while you're waiting, your basic question parable here is telling you, well, you're meant to be investing in the abilities that God has already given you. You're meant to be preparing as every part of your life. I hadn't made this connection when I was putting this sermon together until I wrote that bit. But actually, uh, there is, at our Shekinah evenings on Monday night, we are recognising as a church when we meet together and we're listening to God, that we're in a state of sort of transition sort of waiting God to do this new thing. And it's like, what are we meant to be doing? Well, we sort of keep looking for the, come on and show us it. And it's actually, at the moment, we're meant to be preparing, investing in the abilities that God has already invested in us. That's what we should be doing. That is what this parable is is about so let's jump to our servant who buried his money in the ground firstly in the ancient world by the way burying money in the ground was the normal thing you wanted to secure your money go bury it in the ground mark it well (laughs) don't be a squirrel and can't quite forget where you put all your nuts mark it well Don't go, but I planted a sapling tree by it, but I can't see it now. There's this oak, but I can't see anything else. That's the sort of thing I can imagine. Or it's almost, what's the modern day in Britain? Sticking it under your mattress. And then forgetting it's there. So it's quite normal. Some believe, some of the scholars reading this, and I would tend to agree with them, that actually this is one of these twofold parables. It's it's Jesus talking to the there and then, to the people he was talking to. But clearly it's something that we, as with all things, can look at and apply to ourselves today. And one of the things might well have been here is that the lazy servants sort of represented the Pharisees. Pharisees were given the responsibility of God's word and law, But they effectively buried it from the ordinary people by covering it up with man-made rules and regulations and people could not get at it. Why do you think they did this? Well, Green puts it well. They wanted a religion without change and without risk. How many turned up? I'm not asking you to put your hands up. It's okay. But how many turned up this morning going, oh my life, the chairs are not in a row. This is change. I don't like change. No, you don't have to put your hands up. As a neighbour across the road from this church many years ago said, I moved across from a church because it's meant to be quiet. (laughs) You don't know much about Jesus Christ then. If you don't like change, you don't much know much about Jesus Christ then. And we recognise there is that thinking is today, none of us overly like change. We like certain things to be really stable and just the same. No risks. You ever, ever go to um, invest any money uh, and you go to the bank or something, set up a savings account and maybe, I don't know, pension pot or something like that. It's okay, I haven't done that, don't, don't panic. But the point is, I haven't quite got there yet. But the point is, you go and put in a vast, they tend to ask you, what level of risk do you wish to take? We can put that money 
in a real safe, interest only, basically, you will get definitely all your money back, your initial deposit. You might get some interest, but you may not. You'll get some of it back. Then you'll get the other end of the scale. Listen, it's going to go into stocks and shares and all of that, and it can go up and down. And, you know, in five years' time, you might not get the full amount of your original investment. You would have lost a chunk of money. Yeah? It's the same thing, isn't it? It's that sort of risk. Now, if you're honest, how many would go, no, so I go safe? It's yes, okay, I want my money back, please. Thank you very much. Let's look at five bags and two bag servants. They both doubled their original investment. They got given the responsibilities, they've doubled it up. This parable is not about making sure that you double up that which God has given you or the responsibilities. Be very careful. Because this is like, if I've not done enough and earned enough, God's not going to accept me. This is not about that. It's not what it's here. No, if you actually look, they both got exactly the same reward. Both five and two bags got the same reward. Exactly the same wording. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Exactly the same. No, all two bags. Oh, you know, you get five bags. Come, let's celebrate together. And two bags, oh, come and join us. It's, ex it's not that. It's exactly the same. It is about, gee, God treats us equally fairly if no matter what our responsibilities. Also, we should not try and go beyond the responsibilities that God has given us. Uh, take an example. Let's take five bags, servant. Uh, clearly looks like a high achiever in the business world. Yeah? Give him a company that's failing, he'll probably turn it around, make it profitable, and make it worthy something to be on the front of a newspaper, yeah? That's what five bags looks like. But the person himself is one who, maybe on a social level, is actually socially awkward. Can't really connect with people very well. Give him a big company, man, he'll make it profitable, employ tons, generate lots of funds. But ask him on a one-to-one -one basis, and he's quite hasn't got that social ability. Take two bags here. Two bags, he's not entrepreneurial, really can't have multiple fingers in pies, hasn't really got a business brain, but strangely enough, is really sociably able, able to get alongside people, communicate with them on a one-to-one, -one, empathise and be with them. Let's be honest. Society will look at five bags, man, and go, thumbs up, he's successful. Yeah? We'll celebrate five bags. But to God, both five bags and two bags are actually put both their abilities to good use. They have not gone beyond the responsibilities he has given them. To God, they are both equal in his sight. It's their abilities. They have used their abilities responsibly and with all the opportunities before them. And he celebrates with them equally. <coughs> It's interesting, most two-bag servants will be looking at five bags and wanting to be who he is and trying to be like five bags. God doesn't ask us to do that. God asks us to be who we are, how he has made us with our talents and abilities. He doesn't ask you to be like the person next to you. You ever considered that five bags might well be looking at two bags and going, I wish I was like them, able to be sociable like that. I feel isolated. I want to be just like him or her. Actually, it's God saying, but no, don't try and be like them because you're neglecting your responsibilities that I've given you, which is I want you to be this person. 
You try and be like somebody else, you're neglecting the responsibilities that I have given you. We should never try and be who we are not. Let's go back to the supposedly worthless servant. What was actually his crime? What actually had he done? First, we've got a note that his punishment was removal of his responsibilities and he was thrown out. Do you know what his crime was? He didn't even try. He didn't even try. Been given responsibilities with the abilities and opportunities, he didn't even try. Therefore, he couldn't carry the responsibility. Therefore, it was removed for, from him. Now, exercise. There's a connection for you. Who runs for exercise? Can I see some hands up? Seriously, proper hands. That's it. Thank you, Sophie. Well done. Right. See, proper hands up. Who runs? Good. Okay, who cycles for exercise? Not looking at their mobile phones, maybe concentrating on the sermon that's saying who cycles? You're looking at your Bible, good. Well, do you cycle for exercise? Yes. Well, put your hand up then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Goodness me. Who does swimming? Who doesn't do exercise? Don't, 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 you didn't have to admit to that, seriously, <laughs> really. Goodness me. But you recognise the more you exercise, the more your muscles build up, do they not? Yeah? And you're able to go for longer. Okay, do you walk for exercise? Good. Who, push, who pushes the other kind of pedals, you know, the ones in cars? Yeah, that's not exercise. And I'll bet some of you drive automatics. Man, you're lazy. You don't even lose your left arm and your left leg for club. Unbelievable. But you build up muscle. And the more you use it, the more you can carry. You suddenly find you can lift up this extra chair or, or whatever else, yeah? The more you swim, the more you can keep going. Your stamina is there. I know when I've not been swimming for a very long time, I've got the speed, but boy, does it fade. Pretty tough, too sweet. I hadn't been swimming for a few weeks after the holiday, got in the pool, dying the, because it's t swimming in the sea is completely different swimming than swimming pool. I get in the pool and power off. One of my swimming mates went, whoa, you're really going for it. This was sort of halfway through. He said, gosh, have you got rockets your feet? And I was <laughs> like this. And he looked at me and he went, he said, what's up? I said, I've got nothing left in the tank. I've had it. And he went, what do you want to do? And I said, you swim, I'll follow you. <laughs> I thought, I can swim a mile without even catching a breath. I hadn't done 800 metres. If you don't exercise, you start losing your muscle. <laughs> Just want you to know, that is God's confirmation. <laughs> That's an amen. In, 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 in child talk. Tanya, it's absolutely fine. We have no problem in this building with babies. So please do continue. Don't worry. Same happens in the spiritual realm. If we act faithfully with the initial responsibilities we're given, we exercise our abilities and our gifts, our capacity will grow to handle more. Yes? Hence, ten bags. By this time, he's no longer five bags. He's ten bags. He got given the one bag because his capacity to hold and to carry responsibility and run with it, he was able to exercise that because he had already been faithful in 
small amount, so God's going to give him more responsibility. But you don't use those abilities and opportunities that God has already given you. It will die just like my muscles do if I don't swim. And those that drive automatic cars. No, this is fun. <laughs> so I'll have a go at me later in life when I decide I need an auto because I can no longer. I'm having fun. And you know I don't mean it. But our muscles do give out. Our spiritual ability, our ability to carry more responsibility gives if we don't exercise the responsibilities that God has given us. Some people might ever wonder why, why God has never given me extra responsibilities. Maybe that's because you haven't exercised the one he's already given you. Not trying, I think, is the big issue for God. God loves it when we try. Trying involves risk. It involves risking your reputation. It involves falling flat on your face when it's gone wrong. Risk. It involves going out on a limb for God. Funny enough, last night I was at, uh, at the, uh, an in, I had a bit of an induction fest yesterday. I was at an uh, um, induction of new ministers into, into uh, Baptist churches. And there was one yesterday that was at that the speaker just turned around and said, do you know something? If your vision for God and the, God, the vision that God's given you doesn't scare you, then it's not enough. If you're doing something for God and it doesn't scare you, it doesn't feel like there's a risk involved, then it's not enough. I sat there and thought, hmm, I'll get him to do the rest of my sermon now. It's so easy to turn up, and it's not just about Sunday mornings, but just to use it as a good example. It's so easy to turn up at Sunday mornings and just to go through the motions. It'd be so easy for me as pastor to turn up here, go in the office, do my emails, check my phone, da 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 da, come out here, sit along there, let it just go on. Have nothing changed, bless, have a good week, bless you all. Yeah? That's safe. We're not called to be safe. We are called to take risks, to look stupid. I really, this morning in communion, when Chris said, oh, da, 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 and I said, can I do it? I thought, I haven't got a clue what I'm going to say. Normally I like a Bible in front of me, but I'm going to stand there and risk it and allow God to do what God does. If I look stupid and it all flat, falls flat in my face and nothing happens, so be it. But we have to be risky for God outside as well. Have you got a vision for your neighbours to come to know Jesus? I really got a vision that actually says, I'm willing to look stupid in front of them. For them to go, do you know those weirdos next door? They go to church. Oh, don't go near them. They're strange. They talk about Jesus like he's somebody real. Am I willing to risk praying for somebody, really believing right now that they're going to get healed? And say, I actually want to pray for healing for you, not just, and I'm guilty of this, thing. I'll be praying for you. And let me walk away, and I'll be praying quietly in my bedroom, that's what I mean. And actually, if I walk away, I'll probably forget anyway. By the time I get in front of my front door, I've forgotten I, I promised to pray for you. It's about taking risk. If your vision's not big enough for God, if you don't believe that God's given you a big enough vision, and it doesn't, that vision doesn't scare you, then it ain't big enough. And it ain't dangerous enough. Because it's something you'll do in your strength, not in his and his responsibilities put upon you. It's not meant to be condemnation. It's meant to think, yeah, actually, I want the risky ones. I'll be up front. I got reminded last night. I thought, yes, I got given 18 months ago a big vision here, and I've allowed it to do that. 
Well, that ain't happening again. So let's look. What makes us not take risks for God? What is it about us that doesn't take a risk for the master? Look at the lazy servant. He knew the master, apparently. He states, I knew you were a harsh man. My question mark is, did he? The two others didn't seem to think that. This is why I think that. They seem to have got on with their responsibilities with no sort of sense of worrying about what the master thought. Just think, look at the passage. If they thought the master was a harsh man, do you think they would have boldly gone up and said, look, master, here is double back? Which is exactly, read the passage, that's exactly what happened. They simply said, the servant to whom he had trusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. He came forward. Bags, two bags, man, also came forward as it is in the NLT. One bag, man, just says he came, not forward. There is a confidence, I would read into that, a boldness that they are saying, I can come forward knowing I've done what you've asked. Quite frankly, if they were thought that the master was a harsh man, if their opinion of him was he is harsh, they would not have gone up going, here's my five bags, or my two bags. Here is four, and here is ten. They would have gone up, um, uh, master, I know that you're a harsh man. I've gained five more. Kevin, look at me, we're acting. <laughs> here is five more. Here is five more. Is that enough? Is that enough? Just say yeah. Oh, okay. Cheers. <laughs> Listen, mate, only I ruin your sermons from behind, right? Do you see what I mean? If, you thought, if they thought he was harsh, they wouldn't have gone up with him. Here's five more. They would have gone, I'm not quite sure. Is five more enough? Because he's harsh. We know what he's like. We might, we might have wanted us to triple it or quadruple it or what the other bits are. So ten times it. Do you see what I mean? So clearly, they didn't consider him to be a harsh man. Did the lazy servant have a wrong impression of their master? Was it lack of relationship? I think five and two bags took a risk because they knew that their master was, if you've tried, that's where I'm happy. Their impression wasn't that he was a harsh man. Here's a rhetorical question for you. What's your impression of the master? And by the way, I mean capital M, God. Deep down, what's your impression of God? Harsh or loving? Do you know God can fit into two camps? In most Christians' minds, believe it or not, actually fits into two camps. Underlying fits into two camps. Both camps are wrong. But see if this resonates with you. Either God is permanently an angry God, i.e. God is permanently angry with me, or God is disappointed in me. When God looks at me, he's either angry permanently or he's permanently disappointed in me. Just take a moment. Deep down, forget the Sunday Christianese. How do you really feel Monday to Saturday when you're talking to God? Neither are true. If God was angry with us all the time, he would never have sent his son to die. And if you think you're excluded, oh yeah, that's everybody else but me, um, what makes you so special?
And if you think God is permanently disappointed with, with you, then he wouldn't have left you with any responsibilities whatsoever. What drives our lack of taking a risk is actually our underlying view of God. To be honest with you, it's not about everybody else in the room. It's not about, will I look stupid in front of Rangina if I took a risk? I'm talking about me here, by the way. Because actually, if I believed that God, if I didn't believe that God was either angry or disappointed, with all due respect to my sister, I wouldn't give a hoot what she thinks if I fall in her eyes. Because before God, I'm okay. Yes, you chat things through, but nonetheless, I wouldn't care less because I know that God's not disappointed in me and I know he's not angry with me. It's because I took a risk and tried. Do you know, if you took a risk for him and got it wrong, he'll turn around and say, well done, good and faithful servant. At least you took a risk. You learn from it when it goes wrong. Not nastily, but you'll learn. And you'll learn. Does say he disciplines those whom he loves. So that's another thing you see. Oh dear, what have I done wrong? God seems to be disciplined. Well, if he's disciplining you, amen, welcome, hallelujah. It's proven he's not angry and it proves he's not disappointed because he just loves you. See the point? When I discipline my daughter, I still, I love her. I'm not disappointed and I'm not angry as such. We parents are slightly imperfect. We humans are imperfect. We do allow the emotion initially. God's not like that. But when I look at her, I think, I want the very best for you. I want you to grow. God is so much more perfect than you or I. God wants you to take a risk. He wants you to take the responsibilities to risk change, to risk reputation to risk the fact that the kingdom of God might actually broke open into your neighbourhood, into your families, into your workplaces, because you took a risk. Who's got a vision to see those around you come to Christ today? Who's actually got a vision to see that happen and go, I want them to come to Christ? And if you're sitting there going, yeah, but that makes me feel really comfortable, that's fine, then your vision is not big enough. And God's saying, take a risk. I love you. Stop thinking I'm angry with you all the time. Stop thinking I'm disappointed in you in time. I'm not. Come and take a risk. Give it a go. Give it a try. Who wants to become vulnerable for the kingdom? Who actually wants to be vulnerable for God? Who wants to believe that God is not angry with them or that he's disappointed with them? I said those two words and those two camps and I can tell you I didn't need much for me to notice the reaction it had in a lot of people in this room. God is not angry or disappointed. He likes it when we believe that and try for him. If you believe either of those two things, that's going to drive your relationship with him. That is how you're always going to think every day when you walk forward. When you approach him, oh Lord, Heavenly Father, I love you, da da da. Actually in the back of you, and you're really thinking, I need to appease him quickly. I need to make sure he's all right with me. Got to make sure that he's not angry with me. Got to make sure that he's not disappointed with me. When Jesus died on the cross, that went. Yeah. 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 Take a risk to believe. 
take a risk to believe that God just loves you. Take a risk that he's not angry with you. Wake up tomorrow morning and go, do you know, I'm going to live today believing that God is not angry with me, believing that God is not disappointed in me. It takes some mental ascension to do it. It takes all of that to do it. But it's you that's got to do it. God keeps trying to say to you. But it takes mental ascension from us to go, I am going to believe that today and live my life under that belief. I'm going to take a few moments, I want you to take a few moments to just sit and reflect with what God has said to you. And he's just going to put some nice ambient music. We've got seven minutes yet. And I want you to sit with God and wonder to yourself, what have you said to me? So just take a few moments now. I want you before God to recognise that he has actually given you responsibility. For you, from this day forward, to invest in the abilities and opportunities he's given and will continue to give to you. For some of us, that will mean making to make a bit of a recommitment today to sort of say, yeah, actually, Lord, yeah, I've denied that. I've buried it in the ground. I need to take up that mental responsibility again. Maybe it's long neglected gifts and abilities that you've just put to one side. And you've probably done it because you think God's either angry with you or disappointed. I want you now to sit before God and if you come into one of those two camps that you think either God is always angry with you or always disappointed, talk to him about it now. As he reassures you with his love, don't sit there arguing back with him. You're not God. Don't do the yeah but. And only if you want to, say to God, I'm willing to take a risk for you going forward. Liz, just say something. Keep your heads down. Keep being focused on God. Earlier today, the word invitation wouldn't go from my mind. And I believe there is an invitation today, a fresh invitation from God to reconnect with him. Fresh for today, an invitation to reconnect with him. Thank you. If you want to accept that invitation, sometimes we have to make a physical response. And we're talking about taking risks for God. I think making a slight physical response is not going to be that difficult for us. So if you want to make that fresh response to God, I suggest you move. Either go on your knees if you can, stand if that's easier for you, but if you want to, don't worry about what anybody else in the room is looking or thinking, because that's because they're probably sitting there worrying about, well, I'll wait till somebody else to do it. If you want to accept that invitation, where you are, kneel, stand, whatever is easier for you. But sometimes we have to make a response.
Lord, I pray for us that all of us, all of us, will recognise that you just love us. Recognise you're not permanently angry. Recognise you're not permanently disappointed with us. That you love. And you're actually spurring us on. By giving us responsibilities, you are showing us your love. Actually, Lord, you have taken a risk by investing in us. You have taken a risk by giving us responsibility for your kingdom. Help us to be risk takers, to take the risk to actually believe you love us and then to act accordingly in that love. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.